Thanks, Nushi. Um, my wife, who is a little bit disrespectful, says that you should think of me as the people's laureate. If I can win a Nobel Prize, anybody can. <laughs> and I think everybody ought to want to, too, because, at least if you're a scientist, why wouldn't you want to find out the most important thing you possibly could find out? It's a perfectly reasonable aim and ambitious ambition. So, uh, I'm not actually a scientist anymore even. I don't have a lab. I spend most of the time just swanning around, talking to people like you, advising the odd person and uh, exploring the world. It's a wonderful thing being a scientist because almost wherever you go in the world, you can find mates who share the same ideals and aspirations. But tonight, what I want to do to you is to just explore a little bit the nature of discovery and to tell you about my own discovery as much as I, as I can in the very short time uh, available. So first things first, and uh, a very great scientist, Sir Isaac Newton, leads the way. Um, the only way of finding things out is by doing experiments. A lot of people think that you can just sit down at a computer terminal and think. But I can tell you, at least in biology, nobody ever found out anything just sitting in an armchair. Darwin had to sail round the world before he had his idea about how evolution worked. So that sounds pretty simple, and it is pretty simple, but unfortunately, there are sort of some practical things to, to worry about. And the first thing is, of course, people say that science is a knowledge-based thing, but I think science is an ignorance-based thing. I mean, you, don't, you only find out stuff when you don't know what's going on. So to me, it always feels like a fog, a fog of unknowing. And people will say, well, what are you going to discover next? And of course, you don't know what you're going to discover next. That's the whole point about discoveries. You don't know what's going on. You turn over stones and you hope that there's something interesting crawling out from underneath, but it doesn't always happen. Sometimes you turn over the stone, there's nothing there at all. So I think you can at least promise to go on a voyage of discovery, but you can't guarantee that there will be a pot of gold, hidden treasure, at, at, at the end. And then, you know, we can all find out silly, trivial things, like when's the next train home. It's easy now in the internet and all that stuff. But how do you choose a problem? Isn't that easy? I mean, you might say, well, I really want to understand how the brain works. I mean, that's a pretty good problem. But actually, it isn't a very good problem because it's too hard, it's too difficult. Our brains are encased in... Do you know the simplest brain that is known? We've known the complete wiring diagram for about 25 years. It's the brain of a little tiny worm, and it only has about 147 neurons to rub together. But they still don't know what makes the worm wriggle pretty feeble. So I say, you know, when you come to a human brain which has got something like 10 to the 12th neurons in, connected in very complicated ways, that's too difficult a problem for the time, time being. So you have to break it down into simple problems. There's one other problem I should mention that we have, which is that uh, if you're a good scientist, you have a problem and you solve the problem, then you have a real problem because you don't have a problem anymore. So it's, it's, a, it's a hard life. My, my, my PhD advisor said, Tim, you know, this is a manic depressive business, and it's mostly depression. <laughs> and uh, I think he, he wasn't far wrong. So, as, uh, you know, it, I mean, that's the other problem. I mean, when you tackle a problem, how do you know that you can solve the problem? Maybe you don't have the techniques. Maybe there are 18 things you need to know before you could really tackle that problem. It's, it's, it, is, it, is a, it is a hard life. Nevertheless, there are places in the Earth where um, people seem to do better at it. I think the answer is that you can create a nourishing environment to do science, 
And uh, who better to tell us how to do that than the late, great Max Perutz, who was probably the greatest scientific director I ever came across. He was an X-ray crystallographer. He discovered the structure of uh, hemoglobin, a, a, a complicated structure which people at the time would have said was probably impossible to do. But he did it, and he then went on to choose absolutely wonderful people for this lab in Cambridge, and he got together with people like the famous Francis Crick and Sidney Brenner. And they, they produced an absolutely magnificent environment in which to do science. And it's very interesting to see what he says about that. And the quotations up here behind me are, uh, give, give, give some indication of his, 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 his philosophy. So he says that people came to see him to say, you know, how do you do it? They have to have something like 20 Nobel Prizes in this lab over the years. Absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, why, what have they got that, that, that the others don't have? I mean, well, maybe once you've got 20 Nobel Prizes, it's an inside job, and they just sort of nominate each other. <laughs> and there is something of that, actually. But I think it's more by example than by corruption. Um, I, uh, yeah, anyway. So, uh, you know, how, how, how was it done? So he says, you know, I... Think of Florence in the 15th century, where there were only 50,000 people, and um, there was this amazing flowering of, of great art by any standards, perhaps the greatest flowering of art um, that's ever been seen. So, you know, what happened? Did the government send in a, a gang of interdisciplinary, you know, did they make up this sort of special interdisciplinary thing? Was it the whole point of putting together poets and sculptors and artists and stuff like that? No, of course not. Um, it was the individuals. Of course the individuals were supported. Of course there were people there who were rich as Croesus who would buy and commission their art. But what happened was that people from all over the world came and gathered there because of that patronage and they sparked each other off. And they were no doubt as competitive as hell. And uh, that's probably uh, what's did it. And what Max says is, and I absolutely believe this, is that it, you know, creativity comes out of individuals. It doesn't come out of committees. It comes out of clever people working hard. And the discoveries, you never know where they're going to come next, but for sure, if you're looking in interesting places, you're more likely to make a great discovery than if, you, if, you, if, if you're not. So, uh, interesting places. Now, this is an interesting place, and I bring it up because this is where I made my Nobel Prize winning discovery. It's a very beautiful place. It's called Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and it's where you take there the ferry docks. You go to Martha's Vineyard or um, Nantucket from there by ship. Uh, there are two labs, one bank, one post office, a uh, couple of bars, uh, not, not, not a lot. And the two labs are the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, where they actually they sort of run spies. They have these little, little torpedo-like things equipped with uh, listening devices, and they send them around the world. That submarine that went to find the Titanic was actually looking for a hydrogen bomb that the Americans had lost. The Titanic story was just a cover. Of course, it did find the Titanic, and that's great, but you know that wasn't really its main purpose. So. We once rented a house from the woman who ran the sort of den mother for these people. It was very interesting. They were sort of tor torpedoes. And when they came back, you know, they would sort of swim their way back from wherever they'd been, looking at these Russian harbors or whatever. And you'd plug them into your laptop and find out where they'd been and what they saw. Wonderful. Uh, now, the other lab, about 100 years old, is the uh, Marine Biological Laboratory. And that's where, that's where I went. Um, because... I wanted to study sea urchins. Now, why did I want to study sea urchins? Because I'd heard about sea urchin eggs in my first year of graduate school. And a very great scientist who worked at Caltech in uh, Pasadena, near Los Angeles, had discovered uh, that when sea urchin eggs are fertilized, they turn on protein synthesis. And that's what I wanted to study. I'll show you that in a second. So here I am getting sea urchin eggs. You, you give a, the poor female sea urchin a little tingly electric shock from a bell transformer. 12 volts alternating current makes her shed her eggs. Do the same thing to the male sea urchin, and uh, he sheds his sperm. Uh, mix the eggs and the sperm together, and what do you get? Baby sea urchins. 
Here they are. Aren't they cute? I mean, they're, <laughs> I think they're lovely. <laughs> Absolutely lovely. Now, that, of course, is a tremendously speeded up. It's about, I think, 900 times speeded up. Actually, the first division would take our place up after about an hour, and each subsequent division is about um, 30 minutes afterwards. But still, it's impressive. And this is at seawater temperature. It's not that warm. It's sort of 16, 18 degrees, something like that. It's very impressive. So they're specialized for cell division. I don't know if you noticed, but these divisions were very synchronous, and actually that was the key. I didn't realize the importance at the time. I just thought it was nice. And this is what I was really saying. This is really boring stuff, right? I mean, here we have, you're measuring protein synthesis up the side, time along the bottom. That's the rate of protein synthesis in unfertilized eggs. It's practically nothing, actually. Fertilize them, and there's a lag of about five to 10 minutes, and then suddenly protein synthesis takes off. So that was my focus. What is that switch? What's the molecular basis of that switch going on there? And over the years, uh, I must admit, I did not make a lot of progress in studying that, or rather in understanding it. And one of the reasons was because sea urchins only have eggs for about a month of the year, in this case, in roughly speaking, July. So that by the end of July, there are no more sea urchin eggs. You can do no more experiments. So what I would do is go home, build castles in the air of great hypotheses, come back the following year to Woods Hole, do an experiment, my hypothesis would crumble to dust at the first experiment, and that was it. Then, it was, then you didn't have enough time to think of what the next experiment ought to be. So it wasn't very satisfactory. But along the way, I heard an interesting talk. I'm going to run this movie by one more time, uh, if I can. Let me see if I can go back one. Yeah, let's try it again. So these are slightly different. These, these, these are starfish eggs. And watch what happens. Absolutely amazing. They have this structure and just dissolves away. And basically, uh, what happened was that people did some experiments and discovered that um, that switch was caused by the activation of a mystery thing called maturation promoting factor. Let me show you another movie to see, you can see a little bit more clearly what's going on. It, it is like a sort of Polaris submarine firing a missile. There are chromosomes all lining up, and then, whoomph! <laughs> Fantastic. I love that movie. It was taken by <laughs> Peter Lennart, a, a friend at the, in, in Heidelberg. Uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant movie with triple labeling and stuff. It's fantastic. Anyway, so this was all done by this magic factor that catalyzed cell division, an enzyme that catalyzed cell division. When I heard about that, I thought, wow, that's a cool thing. And people had great difficulty in... Uh, purifying it. And it wasn't my problem. I just thought, gosh, you know, what is catalyzing all this cell division? Began to think about it a lot. And in 1982, when the protein synthesis experiments were going really, really badly, I really began to sort of wander a bit, I must admit. So I started reading this book by Jacques Loeb, a famous Rockefeller, so Artificial Parthenogenesis and Fertilization. What does that mean? Virgin birth. You can stimulate these eggs to develop without sperm. Now, to me, I was brought up in a very religious household, and the idea of virgin birth was actually something that I, you know, learned at my mother's knee. It was an article of faith. And so the idea that one could actually do experiments on virgin birth was really rather attractive. I mean, by this time, I'm afraid I'd lost my faith. So I, I didn't take terribly seriously. So here are Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden, and they're being redeemed by the Holy Spirit. There it is, the dove. Who is going to fertilize Mary's egg? At least I assumed there was an egg from Mary. But the fertilization came from the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's find out in molecular terms whether uh, fertilization and artificial parthenogenesis are the same. So I do a really simple experiment. This is where the ambassador loses it, by the way. The ambassador says, always says, you know, they're very charming, but they're never science. They always come to Tim, that was a lovely talk, but I didn't understand it at all. And this is one of the places where they probably don't understand it, because this is something called a one-dimensional SDS polyacrylamide gel. 
But it's just very simple, really. We're analyzing radioactively labeled proteins. There's one protein, there's another protein, there's another protein, there's another protein. Big proteins at the top, little proteins at the bottom. And uh, I did this experiment to compare, but that's not what this experiment is saying. I noticed something, and this is the Nobel Prize winning experiment. Because what I saw was that this protein, you can see it's the first one you can see being synthesized in this lane 26 minutes after fertilization. It gets stronger and stronger, and then it fades away. Then it comes back again, then it fades away again. And it's very well controlled. The other proteins just go on getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Very simple experiment, extraordinary result, because proteins in those days did not go away. And I realized also that the protein went away when the, just before the eggs divided. So I thought, wow, you know, this has got something to do with catalyzing cell division. Let's have a look in some other eggs around the place. So we looked in starfish and we looked in clams. These are clams. My God, there are two of them here. Look, it's even clearer. The protein comes, the protein goes, and this magic stuff, MPF, turns on at a certain point. And the turning on is because this, this protein is accumulating. The turning off is because the protein gets degraded. That's how it's got to be. Well, when I said that to my people when I went back to Cambridge, they looked at me as though I was completely batty. No way things can be that simple. But I had a feeling in my gut that they pro it probably was. It took several years to really sort of uh, get the whole thing together. And I was vindicated. Here I am with my fellow laureates, Lee and Paul, at one of the many receptions they carry out in, 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 in Stockholm. And it turned out that the answer was, was very simple. And again, this is, just after the, uh, this is just after the presentation. Paul is clutching his medal and his certificate. And I'm hugging Paul. Apparently, we got a lot of brownie points for this because um, Brits aren't supposed to show emotion on stage in this way. <laughs> And that's exactly what it was. It turned out that Paul's protein on the left here bound to my protein on the right here. And the way it worked was uh, terribly simple. By the way, this is, this is me holding a model of my protein, vastly enlarged. I think if, if the, the protein was really this big, you would stretch halfway to the moon or something like that. So it's huge. But that's what it really looks like. I mean, it's not quite as diagrammatic as, 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 as that. But that's what does the biz. That, do you know... In each of you, in one second, two million cells are dividing at any one time. Two million, mostly in your bone marrow, making new blood. Fantastic. Huge amount of cell division going on in this room, and it's catalyzed by this guy here. Amazing. So, really simple. Once you understand what's going on, and we didn't beforehand, the cell makes cycling. That's what I called it, because uh, I was a very keen cyclist at the time. So it's, and it goes up and down. Uh, joins onto Paul's protein, catalyzes mitosis, the cyclin is degraded, CDC2 and so on, off, 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 off you go. Easy peasy, once you understand. Before you understand, you haven't a clue what's going on. Random observation, looking for something completely different, completely screwy, molecular religion. So, the great Erwin Schrödinger of cat fame said, science is a game. And I absolutely agree with that. And it goes on, but a game with reality. You get to check. Fantastic. So the aim, in my view, the secret of successful science, is just having fun. Thank you very much.